Hey guys, Hans here at Shield Canine. Let's talk about how dogs learn. People are always asking me, what commands are you using? What treats are you using? What devices are you using? When can I use this device or that device? And I always say, whoa, whoa, whoa pump the brakes. You don't even know how it all comes together. You don't even know how dogs think, how dogs learn. Why are you asking about these things? These things aren't gonna help you if you don't know how it works. <laughs> kind of is like asking a carpenter why he's using a certain brand of skill saw or what uh, you know how long the nails are that he's using when you don't even know how the structure is built when it all how it all goes together so you need to have a strong or, or at least a basic a cursory understanding of the theoretical framework under which dogs learn okay so that's what today's lecture is going to be about so we have the usual operant conditioning, classical conditioning. If you do, if you're a science-based dog trainer, or you know, if you've done any even be basic behavioral, um, you know, psychology or anything like that, you've learned about operant conditioning, classical conditioning. There are lectures on that on YouTube already. This isn't going to be just one of those because I think the problem with understanding these theories is that they are one-dimensional. They People who read about dog training from the, from the context of operant conditioning and classical conditioning tend to view it as unidimensional. It's just the dog is a blank slate under which you're going to write whatever reinforcers and punishers you want. Okay, and, and you're going to be able to create whatever behavior you want in the dog because he's a blank slate and you're going to utilize your reinforcers and punishers to, 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 to make him what you want him to be. And I'm sorry, that assumption is a completely false premise from which you operate. And if you've been around dogs for any length of time, you really think about it, or if you've trained dogs in, in any real capacity, you know that dogs are most certainly not blank slates, okay? Now, obviously the level of blank slate that you have depends on the age of the dog, but even still, a six week old puppy, I'm sorry, it's not a blank slate because you have behavioral proclivity and drift. And what behavioral proclivity and drift describe is for me, genetic predisposition and learned behavior. So obviously if you have a six week old puppy, there isn't a whole lot of learned behavior there, but there is a whole lot of genetic predisposition. And people like to pretend that this doesn't exist. You know, that's why you get people buying pit bulls and then wondering why the pit bull, you know, has dog aggression or buying a Malawa wondering why the Malawa likes to bite, you know, because oh, we never let him do that. We never taught him to do that. We put him in the doggy daycare. He went to the dog park. Why is he doing these things? Because genetic predisposition. It's a huge part of who and what your dog is. But before we kind of get into this more, I'm gonna take a step back and we are gonna go into the operant conditioning um, and classical conditioning side very briefly, okay? Just so you guys have an understanding. Now, operant conditioning can be separated into reinforcement and punishment. Reinforcement is anything that you do that creates behavior or strengthens behavior. So, whether you want to teach the dog something new or whether you want to make something the dog already knows better, you're on the reinforcement side of the equation, okay? Now, reinforcement can be positive or negative. Now, if I'm giving positive reinforcement, I'm now giving something desirable to the dog, okay? Something the dog perceives as desirable. I'm giving him, you know, treats, praise, toys, whatever. There's all sorts of different forms of positive reinforcement. It's basically anything that the dog deems, like I said already, as desirable. Negative reinforcement. Now here's where people often kind of start to get confused. Negative reinforcement is basically pressure to position. All right? So if I do this and I pull, push down on that leash and I create pressure and the dog lies down, that's negative reinforcement. I created discomfort. She went to the correct position, I removed the discomfort. Now it's very minor, but it's still there. So negative reinforcement, pressure to position. Positive reinforcement, giving of food, or sorry, giving um, anything to the dog that the dog deems as um, pleasurable, desirable, okay? So that's positive and negative reinforcement. So basically, I always kind of laugh at positive only trainers because they all have leashes on their dogs. If you have a leash on your dog, I'm sorry. This is negative reinforcement. 
Because if you are exclusively in the positive force free methodology, you would never use a leash. Your dog would be off leash all the time. You're force free. Your dog gets to make his own decisions and he stays with you because he loves you and he wants all the things that you have. Of course, this is not realistic, which is why they use the leash to control the dog and, 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 and keep the dog close to them. Because if the dog had his own complete, if he was truly force free, he would make other decisions than just their liver treats or whatever it is that they're using. Okay? So, let's talk a little bit before we move on of the limitations, the limitations of positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement, which I already kind of did a little bit. Because all these um, quadrants of operant conditioning have limitations, which is why we don't use them myopically. All right? We often use several in combination with one another. Now, positive reinforcement. The good things about positive reinforcement is it creates a pleasurable experience for the dog. It's motivating for the dog. The dog has fun. He enjoys himself. So you can create a happy emotion in a dog in which you're using positive reinforcement, okay? Now, the limitation of positive reinforcement is desire, okay? You're hoping that the dog has enough desire for the, the liver treats, the ball, the, the praise, whatever it is you got going on. He has more desire for that than for anything else in the world. Now, of course, this is not very realistic. There's squirrels, there's other smells, you know, there's, there's dogs. There's, there's so many things in the world that will distract your dog that will be more rewarding in that moment for your dog than the kibble, than the ball, than whatever the praise or whatever it is that you've got going on. So that's the limitation of positive reinforcement. You can, if you're doing it right, you can create a lot of motivation in the dog, but you don't really have obligation. The dog is optional. He only does things because he desires to do those things. And the idea that he's going to forever desire to do what you want him or her to do, that's a pretty stupid uh, you know, perception that anybody has. It's not realistic on any with any living creature, much less a dog. Okay? Negative reinforcement. Now, negative reinforcement, as I said already, is basically pressuring the dog by creating slight discomfort in one area, and then when the dog moves to the correct desired behavior, you remove the discomfort, okay? Now, the, the good thing about it is you always have it available. Let's say I don't have food. Let's say I have a dog who doesn't want to eat, okay? Um, and I need to do something with that dog. Well, I always have a leash. I always have the ability to make pressure on the dog. Whereas, if he doesn't want to eat, or he doesn't want my toy, or he doesn't care about my praise, as a trainer, I'm kind of up you-know-what creek without a paddle, right? But I can always make pressure, all right? Now, the limitation to negative reinforcement is that for some dogs, it creates a lack of motivation. The dog does it, but they don't look happy doing it, okay? So, obviously, as dog trainers, we want our dogs to be obedient, but we also want the dogs to be happy, all right? So, it's, it's one of those things where for some dogs, and I always say for some dogs, because for some dogs, you can use negative reinforcement. They're just so naturally strong and open and confident that negative reinforcement isn't going to bring them down. They're going to become obedient, and they're still going to look really happy and open. But for some dogs, that lack of motivation, just using the operant condition, sorry, the negative reinforcement side of the um, operant conditioning uh, uh, equation, it's just it, they're just not going to. They're going to look a little flat. Okay, and we don't want that. Can you close that door, please, all the way? All right, so now let's get into the punishment side, okay? So, on the punishment side, we've got positive punishment and negative punishment. Now, positive punishment is, and oh, before we move forward, punishment is anything you do to the dog to make a behavior um, less likely or ultimately extinct, okay? So whatever behavioral contingency that you're targeting with your punishment, the goal is to make it less likely and ultimately non-existent, okay? Now, punishment, like I said, is divided into two quadrants. We've got positive punishment and negative punishment. Now, positive punishment is the application of something to the dog that the dog deems as aversive, okay? And negative punishment is the withholding of something that the dog wants because the dog didn't offer the desired behavior. So I'll give you an example of positive punishment. My dog is... Um, barking out the window, okay? So when he barks out the window, he's wearing a bark collar, and every time he barks, he gets zapped, all right? And very quickly he learns, every time I do this, woof, 
I get that zap. And now very quickly he learns, oh, okay, I, I just, I can't bark. Because if I bark, I'm gonna get zapped, okay? And that's an undesirable thing for that dog. And I say for that dog, and I'll get into that quickly. Um, just let me get to negative punishment first, okay? Uh, negative punishment. Like I said, it's withholding. So let's say I'm teaching a dog to lie down and I have the food in my hand and the dog really wants the food. And I tell the dog down and I, you know, have the food there and the dog sits instead. And I say, uh -uh, I'm not gonna reward you. You must lie down. So I'm withholding the food. So then the dog, instead of sitting, lies down. And of course I reward him and now I'm in the positive reinforcement. And then the dog learns, the thing you really want is withheld when you're offering undesirable behavior. Okay? And when you offer the desirable behavior, that thing that you want is given to you. So, we've got reinforcement, we've got punishment. Now, here's the thing with reinforcement and punishment. Again, you're always kind of battling the human ego with these things. We assume that we know what is reinforcement and what is punishment. Because we have a perception about it. So let me give you an example. I get a lot of dogs come in here. They could care less about food. They really could. Either they're overfed at home, they just don't have that much food drive. Um, you know, there's, there's multi reasons why, okay? And when you offer them, the first thing I always do with the dog to test the food drive is I offer the food. And if the dog kind of half-heartedly lips at the food or kind of like puts it in their mouth and spits it out, I'm always like, eh, okay, not much food drive for me to work with there on the positive reinforcement side, I'm probably gonna go to play. Now, people will be like, well, what if you do the sausages and the cheese and this and that? And certainly, if you change the kind of food you're offering for the dog, you can create more of a pleasurable experience for the dog. But I find that dogs that are kinda meh about, you know, treats and they're very picky about treats, there's just generally not a treat that they will really work very hard for. So I'm really limiting myself if my only game is treats and the dog doesn't really like treats all that much. So I might say, well, I'm using positive reinforcement. Why isn't he motivated? Why does he look flat? Well, your positive reinforcement for him isn't really all that positive. He doesn't care that much. The same with praise. So if I say, good boy, and the dog's kind of like, whatever, right? Versus if I say, good boy, and his tail's wagging and he's all excited and he's jumping on me, well, one of those dogs is deeming the good boy as positive reinforcement, and one of those dogs is not really getting much out of it. I even had dogs where they've come in here, and I've said good boy to them, and they've shown me all their teeth. So now, I'm probably down in the punishment side of things, okay? Because for him, that word from me is not a positive experience for him. It's actually a negative experience for him, okay? so. Keep in mind now, guys, that you don't get to decide what is a reinforcer for the dog and what is a punisher. And the same goes with punishment. Let's say I have an aggressive dog on a pinch collar and he becomes aggressive and he barks at another dog and I pop him on the pinch collar. I say no and I pop him on the pinch collar. He becomes more aggressive. Gah, 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 gah. Well, I punished him. It didn't work. Well, no, you didn't. You didn't punish him. You actually negatively reinforced that behavior. So you might have intended to punish him, but what actually happened was you negatively reinforced the aggression, making him more likely with the pinch collar. And I see that all the time too, okay? So it doesn't mean that pinch collars don't work, by the way. It just means that you don't get to decide what works for that dog, what he perceives as a punishment. The dog will tell you what works, whether it's a reinforcement, whether it's a punishment, okay? Now, I can keep going on this, but we gotta move along. Classical conditioning. All right, now this is where marker training and clicker training come into the equation. It's not enough to know reinforcement and punishment, okay? How do we make it work? How do we communicate the reinforcers and the punishers properly to the dog so he can kind of put these things together with specific behavioral contingencies so that we can now start to influence his behavior? How does that work? Well, now we have this thing called markers or clicker, right? So let's talk about the clicker. Everybody knows the clicker. You make the click noise, you give the dog a piece of food. You make the click noise, you give the dog a piece of food. You do that a few times if he likes the food. After a while, you click, and you're gonna get that. Like, where, where is it, where is it, where is it? Because you've classically conditioned the dog to that strange sound to believe that he's getting his paycheck, the piece of food, okay? 
So the clicker is, everybody understands the clicker is why I use it. I personally don't use clickers and I'll explain why in a second. Now, classical conditioning, if you ever kind of studied it in school, you know Pavlov and the dogs, right? He had a bunch of dogs in a room, he rang the bell, he fed the dogs. He rang the bell, he fed the dogs. After a while, he would ring the bell and the dogs would begin to salivate. He even experimented, he, he could do it 30 minutes before he would feed the dogs and the dogs would still salivate. So that's how much power the, the mark of the bell became for the dogs, right? Where they made that connection between that noise and that food and it was far removed, right? So if, if you're really a skilled trainer, you can actually click a behavior well before you reward the behavior. So you don't have to be super fast with your food or your ball or whatever it is you're rewarding the dog with. You're able to take a picture of the behavior with the click and then reinforce the behavior at a later time when it's easy for you, okay? Now, I don't use clickers. It's just one more thing for me to carry. I actually use a noise. And for me, I just use chip. And when I say chip, I feed the dog, all right? And very quickly, the dog associates that strange noise with the reward. Um, so you can certainly use markers um, for your positive reinforcement. Now, you can also use markers for your punishment, okay? So I classically condition the dog for me, no. No becomes my punisher. If I say no, I'm conditioning the dog to believe that positive punishment is on the way. When I say no, there is a punishment incoming, especially early in the training process. And this creates the ability to on a mark, reinforce a behavior or on a mark, suppress a behavior. And that is really important for a dog trainer to be able to do, okay? So, oh, quickly before I move on, positive punishment and negative punishment. I talked very quickly about the, the benefits and the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the detriments of positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Positive punishment. The benefits are when applied properly, you can remove specific behavioral contingencies within the dog's um, behavior. Okay? So I can, whether he's barking at something, whether he's reactive, whether he's aggressive, whatever it is he does, resource guarding, properly applied, I can use it to remove a specific behavioral contingency, okay? The, 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 the uh, limitation of positive punishment is twofold. Number one, I can't teach anything with positive punishment. So a lot of people run into mistakes where they've, you know, they assume the dog knows something, the dog doesn't. They ask the dog to do the thing, they apply positive punishment to the dog when he doesn't do the thing that he doesn't know how to do, which creates confusion and fear and stress and anxiety in the dog. Okay? You do not teach with punishment. You simply cannot. It's just, it just doesn't work. Okay? Um, the other problem with positive punishment is you have to really be on top of your delivery of the mark. If you are late on the mark, if your timing is off, and the dog doesn't make the association between the punishment and the specific behavioral contingency that you're targeting, you can get what we call suspicious association. And suspicious association is where the dog starts to say, okay, you know, I got punished in this area. Maybe it's something in this area that caused the punishment. Because they don't know that they got punished for barking at the other dog. They just know they were here when they were punished, or maybe they were looking at that blind, and they, so now the next time they look at that blind, they get scared because they make the association between looking at the blind and the punishment. This is the, po this is the problem with punishment. If you don't know what you're doing with punishment, and many trainers don't, and many handlers don't, you, you can cause more harm than good, all right? So that's something that's important to understand. Now, negative punishment, like the withholding, the problem with that is we're getting back into the desire. He's got to really want the, tr the, the treats, so to speak. So let's say if I have a dog who's being, I like to use negative punishment for obedience mistakes. If the dog is making a, a mistake in the obedience learning process, I'll often use the negative punishment, okay? But for like a, an active behavior that the dog is performing, like uh, aggression or something like this, negative punishment doesn't work. I'm not gonna withhold food because he's being aggressive. I have to punish the aggression. But now we're getting into somewhere else. So just so you guys know, negative punishment is good for small things. It's not so much good for big things, okay? So we've covered the reinforcement of the punishment. We're in the classical conditioning before I jumped back. Sorry about that, guys. Um, classical conditioning. Okay, so we were talking about the markers or the clicker, right? This is basically how you use it. Now, for me, chip 
is my positive reinforcer, okay? And no is my positive punisher, okay? And it's, it's, you can also play with adding more markers that mean other things. But again, now we're getting into another area um, and I'm trying to keep this as simple as I possibly can keep it. So now we're over here. We have behavioral proclivity and drift, okay? Now behavioral proclivity and drift, like I already said, falls into genetic predisposition and learned behavior. So every dog that you get as a trainer has genetic predispositions. And the breed and the breeding of that dog will determine the genetic predisposition. So this Malinois I have here, she likes to bite things. She likes toys, she likes fast moving objects, she chases squirrels, right? She's also very sensitive um, and you know very reactive to stimuli. That's genetic predisposition. If you know anything about a Malinois, none of those things are a surprise for you, okay? That wasn't because we did this or that, that's just who she is, okay? That's what she's like out of the box. You can see it from very early on, and it's only further manifested as she's developed. The mistake people make with genetic predisposition is they assume that they see this six to eight week old puppy in front of them, and he's showing all that he's gonna show. Absolutely not. As the dog matures, more and more of the genetic predispositions kick in. That's why you often hear, well, he was really good until he was four or five months old, and then all of a sudden he changed, or he was really good, now he's a, he's a year and a half, and now all of a sudden he's fighting other dogs and stuff like this. That's genetic predispositions kicking in. You know, your Caucasian old charka, he's probably not gonna be so friendly with strange dogs and strange people. You might not see that early, but I, most of you will see it as the dog matures. Same with your Kenna Corso, same with you know a lot of the guardian breeds. They might appear more social when they're young, but as they mature, you'll often see that they become less tolerant of strangers, and that's genetic predisposition, guys. Um, I'll give you an example too quickly before I move on. A lot of my German Shepherd puppies, I don't see a lot of prey drive manifestation when they're young. Right, like my dog Gage, you see lots of videos of my dog Gage. He's nuts for the ball. He's got like 10 out of 10 ball drive, and I don't say that lightly. He's very dangerous with the ball. He's, he's super, super intense about that ball. He will die for that ball. At, at three months old, he could have cared less about a ball. That kicked in about four months, okay? And it, and it wasn't to the degree that it is now. And I'm sure it'll be even worse in another, in another six months. So you have to understand the genetic predisposition doesn't immediately show itself right away. Learn behavior. Now this is important because as dog trainers, we often get dogs that are not puppies anymore. They've had some experiences. Maybe you're adopting a rescue, you're purchasing an older dog. Learn behavior, right, is a big part of it. Now genetic predisposition and learned behavior for me are kind of in the same category because the genetic predisposition of the dog will create behavioral proclivities. So let's say I have a dog who's really suspicious of strangers, okay? Um, and they have that genetic predisposition. I have my Caucasian of Charka, and he's young, he's, he's eight months old, nine months old, and he sees people on the street, and they make him feel uncomfortable. He doesn't know why, but they just make him feel uncomfortable. So he starts trying to cope with that genetic predisposition by barking, whoa, whoa, whoa. And because he's now big, he's 100 pounds, he looks intimidating, People start to avoid him. Well, now he's like, oh, they make me uncomfortable. I bark, they avoid me, or I don't, at least, at least they don't try to pet me. Well, now we're getting into learned behaviors. Now he's learning to cope with his genetic predisposition by barking, okay? So, you know, you guys can start to see now where it goes. You get a lot of dogs, for instance, um, that become aggressive with other dogs, all right? Because they, I'll say, I'll say this one, for pit bull terriers, for instance, or pit bull type dogs, or bullies, or whatever you want to call them, all right? They all tend to have this trait, this arousal-based trait. Like, they're very good, generally, when they're low, in a low state of arousal, but when they become aroused, and they become aroused really quickly, and when they become aroused, they go really, really intense. That's when most of the dog fights happen with those kinds of breeds. That's when most of the dog aggression, or even human aggression, human aggression happen with those breeds when they become highly aroused, okay? So, it starts with play usually. The dog's playing, he's playing, he's playing. He becomes highly aroused, and at some point, he experiments by engaging in aggression, right? Like biting the other dog or biting the human or whatever. And the reaction that he gets from that is so intrinsically rewarding that he then says, okay, well, he doesn't say, but 
then what happens is now we start to create this pattern in the dog where he becomes aroused and he goes into the aggression. He becomes aroused and he goes into the aggression. And now it's a well-worn pathway that the dog is treading. And it's not because of somebody teaching him something specifically, it's his genetic predispositions, right? That's why I always kind of laugh, you know, when people are like, oh, you know, we rehab this, this dog from a fighting ring. It's like, you don't rehab a dog from a fighting ring. If, a dog was, if you have a dog that really was a dog fighter, okay, like a, a real dog that was going in the pit, the pit and doing fighting, that dog loved to do it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been there. He wouldn't have been successful in that activity. So it's really important to understand that, okay? He was getting a lot of reinforcement from that activity because of his genetic predisposition. Now, of course, if I did the same, God forbid, this dog ended up in dog fighting. She would not find that reinforcing at all, right? It would not, it wouldn't work. She just wouldn't be able to do it, right? So a lot of the time, you know, when you understand these things, genetic predisposition, learned behavior, reinforcement, punishment, and you really understand them, and you understand how they impact behavior, you're not going to have, um, you're, it's not going to be so hard for you to decide what, what uh, specific commands you're going to use or what devices you're going to use. Because all those things, you know, what treats you're going to use, all that stuff, once you understand how it all works, the basic framework, framework from which you can operate, then you can select your specific technique that you're going to use to train that dog or to fix that behavior. So I hope this helps you guys um, and sheds some light on how dogs learn and um, kind of uh, maybe starts you thinking a little bit and, um, you know, stop asking me, you know, what, what's the best age to start the prong call or, or what's, you know, what treats are you using and stuff like that. It doesn't matter, okay? If you understand this, you understand the answers to those questions. So I hope this helps you guys. Um, feel free to like, like subscribe, and uh, comment below whether you agree or disagree.